Today we have Dev from F3 Uranium. Dev, you've changed your name. Tell us why. I just avoid confusion. You know, FCU is developing the Triple R project. Um, that's their focus. Um, we are just made a big discovery and at on our project. So we just want to make sure F3 is over here and two different, you know, uh, two different companies and pretty well two different boards, two different, certainly different management. Um, and, you know, I think that we were a project generator model trying to make a discovery, try to get a spot at the table, elbow in um, as the youngest in the family would. Uh, now we are. The, the, it was a phenomenal discovery hole, maybe one of the best in decades. Um, and we are now in the task of growing it. So I think it was important for us to have our own identity um, and et cetera. And of course, Dev, it's, you were one of the top performers for last year. In fact, your stock has been a real standout play. Would you like to comment, Todd? I, I think you were commenting <coughs> earlier on Investor Talk about how you are so good at attracting top geologists. Why do you think yours has moved north? Well, many have fallen 50% plus in the yeah. last year. You know, when it comes to junior company, management's everything. Um, management, management, just like, in, in, you know, in the, um, in the real estate, it's location, location, location. They know that's what it takes. In our business as people, and the smartest thing I ever did was get rid of a crew, board level, every level, and bring on a guy named Ross McElroy, right? Ross, and then his best decision was hiring Ray Ashley. Um, so, you know, and then literally within a year or so, Ray and Ross discovered the J-Zone. Um, and then they discovered the triple R zone. So this one we're calling the JR zone. Um, you know, it's about people, but those people need money. So it's very important for, um, the board and, um, have a business aspect to it where they go, okay, when is it good to raise money? When is that timing? And that requires constant communication with your bankers always getting a sense of what's coming. And there's an old saying, you take money when you can, not when you have to. So we were quite successful in 2021, raising 12 and a half, uh, what, 10 million for the ground, joint venture, another two and a half. So we had 12 and a half million dollars last year to spend. Um, so you have to have good people, good projects, obviously, but I find good people find good projects and they attract capital. So it always comes back to track record of management. So and most of all, why is the stock up, you know, 600% versus others? Pretty simple. It comes down to, it's a discovery. And lasan has got that picture, you know, where the biggest run in the stock is when it's rising up is that discovery mode, how big is it going to be? And once they get a number for it, that's kind of pegs itself. They move towards development. So I still believe we're at the, you know, about a third up that curve. I think we've got a ton more to go. The drill bit. We'll do the talking for us. Um, and, uh, you know, we've got 20, we got, we put in five holes before Christmas and now we're going to put in um, 20 um, uh, more holes this winter, take a little break and have a longer summer program. It's on land. So we don't have to wait for the ice to melt. We don't have to wait for the ice to build up in the winters. We can go right on land and keep working all year round. And of course, the impact of the geopolitical issues with yeah. Russia in Ukraine has undoubtedly been had positive effects for people in the uranium market that right. are in, based in North America, for instance. Can you comment right. on that? Well, absolutely. <laughs> I, I think that, you know, like we, we've talked that, you know, when you look from a world perspective, the, the, look, uranium is going to rise for two reasons. One, decarbonization. If that's something that the world's really serious about, you have to have an energy that's base load power. I mean, turn it up and down, not intermittent like wind and solar. So you need clean energy. That's number one. So when I talk about fission, I would say, you've got to believe the world needs more energy. And that's easy. Over 1 billion people in the world don't have electricity. Another 2 billion in what they would have called a poverty of electricity, I meaning they have brownouts or very little access. So 3 billion people out of 8 billion don't have electricity. You know what? They don't want to be poor. They don't want to be poor. They they don't they want food. They don't want to be malnutrition. So 
the demand for power goes up. Just go to, uh, so demand for, look at how silly, how prices have risen four or 500% in certain countries in the European common market because they believe in wind and power. Well, it doesn't work all the time. So you've got this drive for decarbonization. And like you say, the second one is, which I never thought would happen straight up with you, is the security of energy that you've got to have. And that's one thing nuclear power allows you is that you can have your own energy and you're not dependent on others because you can move this stuff around very easily. Um, so that's what I see as decarbonization and you want everybody wants their own energy. And now with the Ukraine war, people are saying, I don't want Russian uranium. In fact, today, I just got a clip um, that the European common market voted like 400 to 30, whatever it was, that no, we're not having Russian uranium. And that's a big thing because um, they produce between their groups, um, including Kazakhstan, they produce 40% of all uranium in the world, 40%. On top of it, they have over 40% of the and if, if by the time you get uranium, put it in the reactors, two years in there, processing enrichment. Well, Russia own controls that too. Good news. Uranium is, by many standards, not even 2-3% of the entire fuel cycle. In other words, uranium can go from $50 to $200, okay? And the end user, when they get the electricity bill, will see maybe a 10% rise. 10% but it could go crazy here. So, you know, uranium prices can go through the roof, but it will not impact utilities financially. It just won't because that's a small, small part of their overall cost. So, which is good. I mean, it's good news for like uranium is, you know, $200. All these stocks are up, you know, 10 times from here, but it doesn't matter to the utilities. Remember that the most important thing is they've got to have it. You can't shut down a nuclear reactor you don't have enough uranium, right? So that's the black swan event that I see is that where does this uranium come from? Um, and, and it all depends. I think with the vote next week in, in the U.S. Uh, Congress, are they going to do exactly what the European common market has said? Embargo on Russian uranium. And it's a big thing for the states. Every 10th household, every 10th household gets electricity from Russian uranium. I mean, if the average American knew that, whoa, <laughs> you see craziness. The topic of security of energy, fascinating. Will you be at PDAC to tell us more about what's going on? Yeah, that's not my area of expertise. I simply, you know, listen and I, you know, but for me, absolutely, we'll be at PDAC. And by that time, hopefully we've got, you know, uh, it's only four weeks away. Hopefully we've got some more. The assays will be out and we'll have more scintillometer results and that'd be even more time to talk about where we're going. As I, as our technical people say right now, they're trying to follow the geology wherever it takes them and it goes from there. Well, as always, thank you, Deb, for the update on F3 Uranium. Thank you.